morning. Let's sing praises to the Lord. Angels from the realms of glory. Angels from the realms of glory. Good morning. Do you realize you just prayed your first prayer in that first song? Come have your way, Lord Jesus. That's just not words on a screen, but that is the prayer of our heart this morning. As we come this first Sunday that follows Christmas, we've been waiting for this day. We've been journeying the last four weeks, a Sunday each in Advent, lighting the candle, talking about hope, talking about peace and joy and love, and then Christmas Eve, lighting the center candle, the Christ candle, recognizing his presence with us. And so as we sing that song, it's not just a great opening song, but it declares really the purpose of the day. Lord, come, be Emmanuel, that word which means God with us. That's our prayer. We, we come this morning because we like each other. We come this morning because we like to sit next to the people we're sitting next to. But first and foremost, we come this morning because that's the prayer of our heart. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We want to meet you in the midst of our journey and in the midst of where our life circumstances are. And in this first Sunday after Christmas, we want to celebrate God's grace and mercy upon us. In a moment, we're going to sing uh, some old Christmas carols that you have sung time and time again. And, and I was just struck, you know, when you, when you have songs like that, there are these songs that, that you, um, you just know and you can just sing and, and you don't even really know. I mean, you know them so well, you can just, you can just sing them, right? I was struck this morning as we began in, in first service that those words are powerful words. 
And so as we sing, and, and I want to invite you at home, sing along in your living room with us as well. Um, as we sing today, may these words have new meaning for you. Words you've heard a hundred times. May they have new meaning this Christmas as we give thanks for all that God has done. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for this day and for your presence. We're so thankful for the journey of the last few weeks that now we recognize and, and can cry out in that first song, oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. And as we lift, Father, these old Christmas carols of the church, may they not just be something that we just know so well we can sing, but may we hear the words in fresh ways. May we pray the prayers of our heart and that, God, in the midst of that, we would experience Emmanuel. Come, fall fresh in our hearts and in our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and let's worship together. Oh, come all ye faithful. Oh, come all ye faithful. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, 
Christ, the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come down. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise. against us you are strong to say in your mighty name king of heaven come king of heaven come down king of heaven come now let your glory reign shining like the day king of heaven come In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has chosen to us, spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. In the darkness we were waiting without hope.
you sing that verse one more time, just as your as your prayer? Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three. hear our words today. Hear our words that aren't just songs that are words that are on a screen, but God, they are the prayer of our heart today. Hear us, we pray. We come to give thanks and to praise and to proclaim that you are the King of Kings, that you are the Lord of Lords. And in this season, we are reminded just how wide and, and deep your love is for us when we think about you answering your people and and. and tearing open the heavens and coming. But it wasn't until you went to the cross that we really understood just how deep and wide your love is for us. And we come this morning as a people who recognize our need for you, our need for Emmanuel, God with us in the midst of our relationships and our tomorrows and our families and our jobs. God, there are so many things that are just unknown in our life and we just confess to you. I confess to you. I'm just pretty lousy without you. I can't do it without you. And so, Lord, I need you. We need you. Speak into our hearts and lives and come. Come and pour yourselves out just as you answered the prayer of your Old Testament people and tore open the heavens and sent Jesus. Father, we pray today that you would tear open the heavens and that your Holy Spirit would just fall fresh upon our lives right into the places in which we need. For just as this joy has, this week has been full of joy, it's also had moments of strain and moments of toughness and moments of grief as, as every one of us have somebody around the Christmas table that we miss. Whether that is someone who isn't with us any longer and has passed away, or whether that's somebody who couldn't come home or somebody who wouldn't come home, there are these places in our heart that in the joy of the season, that the only way they can be filled is if you, by your grace and mercy, will just pour out your spirit and answer the call of your people as we cry out, Emmanuel. God, come, rain down on us. Oh, Lord, may all that we do and say today, may it bring honor and glory to you. And as we open up your word and you challenge us, would we be, be, would be, be reminded we are not alone on this road, that you are with us, and that we want to proclaim this truth of Christmas, not just because of the season, but because it's a truth that has changed and is changing our lives. Moment by moment, day by day. If we will let you, you will create in us who you've always envisioned us to be in this season and beyond. We give you our thanks. We proclaim our hope. Come. Lord Jesus, come. And it's in his name we pray. Amen and amen. And you can be seated. Good morning. Um, how was of your kids? How was your Christmas? Good. Just kind of good or like really good? Oh, really good? That's good. Wow. It doesn't actually fly. I think it's a Paw Patrol truck with a helicopter. Wow. And a motorcycle and a, a, motorcycle and a hovercraft. <laughs> it sounds like you had a great Christmas. And you got a rose? No, we got LOL. LOL. Oh, LOL dolls. Cool. You got friend two, two LOLs. Wow, that, you guys had a really great Christmas. Oh, Gwen, yeah. 
a baby chick born on Christmas Day. Wow. Did you name it Christmas? No. Wow. We well, named it Christmas dinner. That's Christmas what we named dinner. it. Yeah. yeah I think so. That's next year. <laughs> well, I want to hear all about all of your Christmases. So come and find me after church and tell me so many fun things that you got for Christmas because I want to hear all of it. Um, one of my favorite moments from this Christmas uh, was getting to spend it with my nephew who's two and a half years old. You guys know Jojo. He's in the nursery right now. Um, he got a toy kitchen for Christmas from his grandparents and I got to give him the food that goes in the kitchen um, and my favorite moment of all of Christmas was watching him open that food because he lifted the lid on the box and he took a step back started shaking <laughs> and said toys <laughs> and it was just so precious and so cute and every time Jojo opened a present he would say Jojo so excited and <laughs> start shaking again and open more and more presents um so kids I have a um a a little game for you guys to play. This is called, What's a Good Game to Give a Baby? Okay, so, because um, he's just two. So, um, stand up if you think um, a baby would like a blanket or an alarm clock. So, stand up if you think a blanket or raise your hand if you think an alarm clock. Blanket, a good gift for a baby or an alarm clock that's going to wake him up in the, okay, <laughs> I think a blanket. That's right. Okay, so don't... I, I thought babies were alarm clocks. Yeah, so they don't I, uh, need an alarm clock. Uh, not need it. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, stand up if you think a baby would like a toy fire truck. A toy fire truck. Or raise your hand if you think they would like a box of matches. <laughs> I think they would like a fire toy truck. That's good. Okay, uh, last one. Raise your hand. If you think the baby would like a baby doll to play with, or raise your hand if they want um, scissors. <laughs> scissors, no, 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 but they want a baby doll. Okay, good job. So clearly there are some gifts that are good gifts for a baby, like Jojo got a toy kitchen and toy food, and bad gifts for a baby like matches and scissors. That would not be good for your baby. No. <laughs> but did you know, you're going to learn today and when you go to your Sunday school class that there are some people that brought gifts to baby Jesus and you're going to get to decide if they were good gifts or bad gifts for a baby. Um, but we also want to remember to give Jesus a gift this Christmas. Maybe you got lots of gifts, maybe you gave lots of gifts, but Jesus we get to give Jesus a gift too, and that is our heart and our love and our worship. And he doesn't want those things just because he's greedy, and he's like, yeah, you better start singing songs to me because I'm Jesus. No, he says, <laughs> that would not be very kind. Um, but he knows that when we pray and when we read our Bible and we love and we worship Jesus, that it's good for us too because it, it makes us into the kinds of people that Jesus originally created us to be. So this Christmas... Uh, before we just wrap, put all the way the decorations and say goodbye to Christmas, make sure that you spend some time with Jesus um, and to give him a gift that, of your heart. Okay, who's ready for the ice cream drawing? Let's see who wins this month. Lots of you part oops, participated. That was, they're, they're trying to escape. Do you want to draw the name? Who's going to win the name? Pick one. Okay, let's, can I read it? Thank you. The winner is Elizabeth Hudebray. Yay! Congratulations, Elizabeth. We will find a time for you and a friend uh, to get ice cream with me sometime, okay? All right, I'm going to pray, and then you'll get to line up for your classes. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for Christmas and for all of the gifts that you have given us and for the time that we've had to celebrate uh, 
you coming to earth, God, and all that you have given us. God, I pray that we won't let Christmas pass us by before we give you the gift that you want, which is us. And that when we give ourselves to you, God, we know that you will work in our hearts and create us uh, to be who you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you're in preschool or kindergarten, your teacher is Mrs. Adams. And if you're in first or second grade, your teacher is Mr. Gromfer. And if you're in third or fourth grade, your teacher is Mrs. Hudebray. Uh, if you guys may go and enjoy your classes. Well, that was fun. I wish you could have been in my uh, spot up here and watched Elizabeth's face when she found out she was getting ice cream. It was... I hesitate making that face because it will forever be on YouTube uh, for those of you that are watching at home. But uh, what a joy it is to see the joy that is in uh, kids' faces as a part of Christmas. And, uh, and I love that part of that joy is tied in with the faith community here and the continuation of the lesson as they go from this place. So we love our kids. We're thankful for them. Let me just talk with you a couple things that are coming up that I want to share more than a couple and, and kind of just out, uh, lay out uh, the next few weeks as far as opportunities for discipleship together. Uh, first, uh, we won't have family night this Wednesday night. There'll be one more week without it. And then January 6th will not be the start of family night, but it is uh, an event in which we're inviting everybody to come participate. It is in the exciting thing of undecorating. Now, if you think decorating is fun, undecorating is just as fun um, because uh, well, really it's about the people. And, you know, I kind of miss the years, you know, for the last two years, we've had this tree. Um, don't tell anybody, but that tree isn't real. Uh, but, you know, but my previous like 21 other years, we had real trees. And what I loved about undecorating night is we just set it on fire. Um, and, and Kyle would uh, like burn things in the parking lot and all kinds of stuff. And I don't know why I'm even talking about this uh, kind of thing. We're tied to tell you we have a lot of fun on decorating. So come. It's just a great time to hang out together and to spend time. We'd love to have you participate January 6th. Then the next Wednesday night is what I want to talk to you about. It's the kickoff of our next semester for family night. And our family night will start uh, again at 6 o'clock. And uh, we'll have uh, activities and classes for every age group. Uh, our kids have classes that, that uh, we'll meet together. Our teens are meeting in youth group together. And then Pastor Kobe is kicking off a new class starting that night. And in your bulletin, you'll see a brochure that's there. Or if you're watching at home, you'll see more information on our website. And that class on Wednesday night is called Intentional Parenting. Now, I know that when I say that, some of you just check out because you think, well, that doesn't apply to me. Like, I don't have kids at home or I'm almost done. Let me just tell you what we're trying to accomplish in this class. We're trying to say that this is for every age group because even if you don't have kids at home anymore, you have walked through this road. And this is a place in which we want all age groups to participate. We need some of your wisdom. This is gonna be a discussion class. And so things that you've learned along the way, or maybe you have grandkids that you are working with, and how, how do you think about that? Or maybe you're gonna have grandkids one day. How do you think about that? Or maybe you're like me and you're trying to figure out this new way of what does it mean to parent adults? I have two kids who at least chronologically are now adults. And, and, and what does that mean? And so it really is for all age groups. It's gonna be on Wednesday nights and we're gonna meet for about an hour or so. We'd love to have you come and be, and be a part of it. And then the next day, two more classes that are available uh, on Thursday. There's a Thursday night women's Bible study and you'll see a, a, a handout in your bulletin or online about that, the, uh, the armor of God and the times are there. Again, that's gonna be in a, in a couple of weeks. We'd love to have you come be a part of that on January 14th. And at the same time, the guys are meeting and the guys, I don't know why the guys really have it better on Thursday night night because the guys get dinner. The guys eat. So we eat and a, and a new series that's kicking off called The Seven Miracles of the Gospel of John. And so we'd love to have you come be a part of that. Intentional Parenting Wednesday night and then Armor of God and the Gospel of John on Thursday night. Of course, we have the Celebrate Recovery on Friday. We have other activities, Men's Prayer Thursday morning. Lots of places to be involved and for your kids, for your teens, and for adults as well. And we'll encourage you to be a part of it. Out in the foyer is... Um, 
is our, uh, our mailboxes that are out there for Christmas cards. And we'd love to have you look under your name um, because uh, the staff Christmas card went out. You should have that if you're on our mailing list. Uh, it should be in there. But here's what happens is we go in the entire season we go through. And, and we get to the end, and we look inside, and, uh, and we, we look, and, and Kyle Yake has not taken any cards. And we say, Kyle has been here every Advent Sunday, but he hasn't taken his cards. You know what we do with those? We open them, and if there's anything inside that, we keep it. So that's how it works. No, we, we really don't. But uh, uh, check uh, your cards out there. We'd love to have you pick up the Christmas cards that are, that are out there. And then I invite you, of course, always to take the connection cards that are in the seat that are in front of you and to take that out and to um, fill it out and let us know that you are with us. Uh, on that card, there's a place for prayer. If there's a way we can be in prayer for your family, our staff, and uh, our prayer team that meets on Wednesday, uh, prays through those requests and continues to pray. Coming up is uh, very soon is our, our student retreat, our teen retreat, is January 22nd to the 24th. And uh, registration is open for that now. Pastor Carly's been working with a youth pastor in Coeur d'Alene as we have this combined uh, youth gathering and really putting together a great weekend of, uh, of discipleship and fun for our students. And they've got it designed very carefully around all of the criteria that we're living with, with sanitation and all those things. And, and in fact, if we're in stage one, it'll look like this, stage two like this, stage three like this. Um, and so all of those precautions are being taken. At the same time, wanting to provide for our students uh, an incredible time of, uh, of not just fellowship, but an incredible time of discipleship together. And so if you're interested in knowing more about that, you can write that on the connection card, or perhaps you'd be willing to say, hey, I'd help a student go, because it costs money to go, and you'd want to be a part of that. We'd love to talk with you about that as well. And then at the conclusion of the service, you can bring the cards up to the offering box that's here uh, in front of me, and, uh, and just a reminder and an invitation that um, part of our worship is, is participating in um, in our offering together, whether that's in the box or online, that the stewardship of our life is part of what God is training us and honing us to be. And so I'd invite you to think generously about the ways in which we invest things for eternity um, that make a difference in the life of the kingdom. So let's just pray together. Father, we're thankful for all the different places that, that, and opportunities that we have to serve and be a part of. And I would just ask, Lord, that you would help us uh, steward what you have given us, and I pray, pray blessing on the gift and the giver today, that, Father, you would use the offering today to continue the work that is done inside of these walls, to continue the work that's done in the, in the community in which we live, and the missionaries around the world would be blessed as well, that we really would live out that prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done, right here on earth. And, and so, Lord, help us to be a kingdom people in how we live. We just pray that you would open our eyes and open our ears to hear from you as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning, as we turn to, um, as we turn to our teaching time, we are going to be looking at probably the, the most well-known of the birth narratives. It's found in Luke chapter 2. And I'd invite you, if you're able, to stand for the reading of the gospel as I read Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 1. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to marry, married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom 
his favor rests. This is the word of God given for the people of God. And we respond together by saying, thanks be to God. You can be seated. Well, I did a little checking, and it is, uh, it's 101 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. According to Google Maps, Google Maps says that it will take 33 hours if you are going to walk along the way. Now, now the 33 hours of walking, that doesn't include rest stops. It doesn't include food. It doesn't include, you know, picking flowers along the way. It's 33 hours uh, of walking. And I have to believe that if you're walking for 33 hours, at least the last third of your 33 hours is going to be slower than your first third. And of course, to arrive in 33 hours, Google is counting on paved roads and, and, and bridges and other improvements to infrastructure that would not have been there in the first century. And as good as Google is, it doesn't account for such contingencies, like bandits that are hiding behind rocks, like, like deep rain that washes gullies out in the middle of the road, or, or the fact that there is no room in the local motel. And if you're nine months pregnant while you travel, you might as well throw the 33-hour Google time frame out the window, because I don't think that's going to have any, any chance of making it. It's hard to imagine how, how tough this journey was because for us, this is a story that we just know over and over again. We just know Jesus and Mary and they went to Bethlehem and we sing songs ab about it. But, but to think about the brutality, how tiring it was, how dangerous it was, how long it was, how unpredictable, and you might even say foolhardy. But it wasn't Mary and Joseph's idea. They're not taking a vacation. They're not heading, heading south for the winter. Caesar Augustus has called for a census, and, and everyone has to go to their ancestral home. Joseph lives in Nazareth in Galilee. It's about 100 a, a miles north, but his people, his roots, are in Bethlehem, and so that's where they need to head, and as they make their way there, there's this, this difficult journey this difficult days of travel, and Mary threatening to go into, into labor at any moment. And, and actually, that's probably more true than not. I mean, I'm thinking if I'm Mary, I am threatening to go into labor at any moment along this journey. And all of it is done just so that they can go and sign some government papers so that they can get taxed even more than they're already being taxed right now. Now, I'm sure that this did not uh, help Caesar's popularity rating. It's stuff like this that can make you really hate invading, oppressive, occupying powers. Count Mary and Joseph among the countless people who down through the ages have suffered from a soulless bureaucracy. They represent the poor and the powerless the defensive people everywhere in all times who, who have had to live under the whims of whoever happens to be Caesar in that moment. They represent all those that have been disrespected and oppressed and feel out of control. Joseph and Mary go on this long, difficult journey at the worst possible time. Why? Because they have to. It's just, it's not up to them. And even though Bethlehem is their ancestral city, it seems that either in their family, that, that either they've had a falling out in their family, or they're not close to their family, or their family's moved away because they're going back home, they're going back to their roots, and the best place that they can find is to sleep in the stable, in a barn, a place where the animals stay, and that's where Mary ends up having the baby. They go to Bethlehem to be counted, but the real irony of that is they aren't counted. They don't count at all to Rome other than somebody to pay a tax. They, they are nobodies. Their only hope, if they have hope at all, is not in Caesar Augustus. It's not in the power of Rome. It's not in the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Their only hope is in the God of Israel who has sent an angel to them and has sent a vision to them and has told them a story about what is going to happen. And you just have to imagine that if you're on that journey, the brutality of the journey, the, 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 everything that's taking place, you begin to wonder a little bit, did we hear the angel, right? God, are you really with us? Because this is not the road we thought we were going to take. Are you really with us? As American power and influence has grown over the last century, hope has often become a casualty. 
We become more confident in our strength and in our promises, and, and, and we begin to imagine ourselves, we don't like to say it that way, but we imagine ourselves as that we don't really need anything, we don't really need hope. Who needs hope when you have unfettered success? Who needs hope when you have such great resources? Instead, we begin to express the longings of our future, not in our hopes, but in our hope nots. And sociologically, we see that to be true over and over again. When you have everything you think you need, the longing of your future, the dreams of your future are not about your hopes. They become about your hope nots. I hope the stock market doesn't crash. I hope my kids don't end up on drugs. I, I hope I don't have to go to a nursing home. All of, I hope I don't have to this or that, or I hope this doesn't happen. All of which shows us that we're humming along pretty good. And we don't want some iceberg to lay in our path. You see, a lot of folks come to the point where they feel they really don't need anything beyond their own resources. They got it figured out. They're smart enough. They got enough stuff. They, they don't need anybody's help. They've got it figured out. We're America, for goodness sake. Life's supposed to be better with generation after generation. Isn't that what we're told? But look around. Terrorists are striking. Predators are preying on children. A bomb blast on Christmas morning in Nashville. Seemingly endless wars go on and on. Computer hackers and our own government apparently knows more about us than we know about ourselves. Our culture has become harsher. It has become more polarized, less compassionate, more angry. Our 21st century world is not so hunky-dory. And yet, we so often believe we are self-sufficient. And we believe we can handle it on our own. We can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We've got it what it takes. We can do it on our own. But over and over again, in an instant, that changes. In an instant, life can change our minds quickly when we, when we lose a job, when we face an illness, when we lose a loved one, when we go through a divorce, when we're struggling with addiction, when we're worried about our children, when we're watching someone that we really love continue to make terrible choices. And, and can we just add to that list all of 2020? Just, just add the whole year. We can quickly understand why we need hope beyond ourselves. Hope in something, not hope from something. If we're really going to have peace, it won't be something we can manufacture. It won't be because we're smart enough or rich enough or wise enough or it won't be any of that. We cannot manufacture our own peace. And at some point we become Mary's and Joseph's walking on a road that we didn't really count on walking and we'd rather not be there. It's 101 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. It's a long, hard journey. It's 6,656 miles from Sandpoint to Bethlehem. That's if you go in a straight line, and we know there's no Sandpoint International Airport that's going to get us there. We would have to stop along the way. But for us, the road to Bethlehem is more a journey of the heart. It's more a journey of hope, a journey towards peace, a journey towards the wonder and promise that God sends into the world and into our lives at unexpected times, in unexpected places, through often unexpected people. Joseph and Mary made this hard journey to Bethlehem. And I just have to wonder as they're journeying along and it's just long and it's difficult, you just have to wonder, as I said before, that they're, they're thinking, did the angel really say this? Did we just have bad pizza that night? I mean, was this a dream? Is this really what God wants? You know, when you're physically and emotionally tired from the journey, it's so easy to begin to question the things of God. God, are you really here? Are you really with me? For the most part, Palestine consisted of dangerous, rugged expanses of land. Arid temperatures scorched the soil, the earth was parched, vegetation was scarce, and so was water. Joseph and Mary, added to this huge list, are trudging through some of the most harsh, bleak landscape. But as they approach Bethlehem, things start to get better. Things start to change. The very name Bethlehem means house of bread. Travelers that are approaching Bethlehem would begin to take some joy, and all of a sudden there are wheat fields. All of a sudden there are vineyards. 
There are olives. There, there, there are figs. The, the, the fertile land has appeared out of this desolate environment. Bethlehem is a place of promise. Now, Bethlehem was never known as a religious city before the birth of Jesus. Nobody ever thought about it being a, being a holy place. Jerusalem is the holy place. But Jerusalem is six miles away, but, but by, by culture and sensibility, it's a lot further than six miles. Bethlehem was a small place, but it was uh, a, a hub of government. Herod lived there. Census takers lived there. Tax collectors lived there. But by, by no stretch did Joseph and Mary think they were on some kind of religious pilgrimage. Bethlehem was the, uh, the ancestral home of David. Luke talks about that. And people hung on to that. Even though it's been hundreds of years since David has been around, uh, they still had that in their mind. When they thought of Bethlehem, they thought of David. And so it would be real easy to think that, that, that Bethlehem, Bethlehem was a city that people knew of whose glory was really in the past with David. There are some references to Bethlehem in Scripture. Micah spoke of the coming of the Lord to Bethlehem. But those hopes seem just kind of quaint or something that's still a long way off. I mean, you read that in Micah and you think, yeah, but that is not the present reality. So that's got to be somewhere in far in the future somewhere. There were prophecies and dreams about a Messiah coming from Bethlehem, but that wasn't anything that they were expecting. They certainly weren't going to expect it, it, it to come in and, and be in a barn somewhere. That wasn't part of expectations at all. So depending on how you looked at it, Bethlehem's days were either long past, their best days were in the past, or, or the prophecy of their days were somewhere hopeful in the future, but not the present. For the present, it, it, this is occupied territory. In the present, this is not so good. And I get to thinking about that, and I began to think about how often do we think of that in our own lives? In our own lives to say, you know, our best days are really the glory days. Our best days are back there, and, 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 we, and we think of those, and, and we're hopeful for the future. It's just somewhere out there. You know, someday it's going to get better, but, but the present, not so much. And yet it was exactly at that kind of time in history when there's a foreign occupation, when the nation is at a low point, when they're caught somewhere between the glory days and a hope that will come, it's exactly at that moment in history that Jesus breaks in. He was born not just in Bethlehem. He was born in a particular place. There was no room in the end. The best that Mary and Joseph could do was a stable, a place for animals. It was a humble, inauspicious The king of the universe, born in a lowly manger. Luke tells us about it. Luke tells about it. We read about it about that night, the child born in a stable, placed in a manger, in a, in a feeding trough for animals. And we, we read that and we think of Linus reading it or, or we think of this, this kind of romanticized version. We think of all the nativities that we love to enjoy. But let's just be honest about it. I mean, we, we kind of romanticize it. How many women here would sign up to say, yeah, I want to give birth in a barn. That's where I want to do it. Like Nobody. And, and, and once the baby's born, I'm going to put the baby in the feed trough. Nobody wants that. It isn't glamorous. It isn't romantic. It isn't comfortable. It isn't sterile. It isn't hygienic. And it certainly isn't easy. And, and the angel's announcement that we read about in Luke chapter 2. I mean, this is the God of the universe. People have been crying out, oh, God, come down. The God of the universe comes. And the angel's announcement is not to the religious leaders who, who are watching. It's not to the leading citizens. It's not to the world leaders. It is to the lowly shepherds, the lowest of the low, who are out working in the fields. We, we think culturally then, the shepherds being this, this low class of people, and, and yet we also think of different class in our own lives. Who would Jesus make himself known to? This is an unexpected birth in an unexpected place with unexpected people. A common, humble birth. And it was a birth that brought all of the themes of the Advent candle into the world. Of peace. Of hope. Of joy and love. And it still brings that today. The birth of Christ celebrated by the rough shepherds. If that is true, then what the angels said was true. This really is good news of great joy for all people. And if the shepherds are included culturally, that's all people. 
We think of culturally in our own life. Who, 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 who do we think of that are on that low rung, like with the shepherds, that, that culture judges that way? Can I just say, this says good news of great joy for all people. This season, some of us find ourselves like Joseph and Mary traveling a road that we would not have chosen for ourselves. A journey can be 101 miles or 6,656 miles. But sometimes the journeys that take place in the heart and the soul are the longest and the hardest ones. We can reach that place where we're no longer confident in the continual presence of and progress of the journey. We can reach that point where the empty promises of Caesar no longer ring true. We can get to that point that we are at the end of our resources and the end of our strength and our intelligence and our good looks and our good fortune, and we could add all of them together, and it's still not going to be enough. And if we get to that point, and I pray to God that we do, then maybe we're at the point where we are ready and open to hear of the wonder of Bethlehem, of a God who breaks into the most difficult circumstances and is with us. See, God never has forced his will or his way upon us. More often than not, God doesn't show up with pyrotechnic displays. Sometimes God arrives in unexpected ways, through unexpected people, in unexpected places, even in the midst, and maybe especially in the midst, of the difficult parts of our journey. I, I, had, a, I had a come to Jesus meeting uh, this week. You, you know what one of those are, right? Where the Lord slaps you upside the head, or sometimes he uses other people to slap you upside the head. It's, it can be painful, depending on who the person is. But I, I just confess, I was, I was driving in my car this week, and, and I was heading, I mean, you know, to-do lists, things to do, places to go, and I'm, and I'm driving along, and, uh, and there's this ad on the, on the radio, and the ad is depicting this family that is sitting in the living room with, with in front of the Christmas tree, and the carols are playing, and they're drinking hot chocolate, and they're just having this wonderful Norman Rockwell, you know, kind of, kind of moment. And I'm, and I'm listening to that, and, I, and, and I'm busy on the other hand, and I, and I tell you, just welling up within me was just like this, this angst to say, well, why can't I have that rest? I'm exhausted. Why can't I have that, that kind of hot chocolate moment? And then it hit me. If I'm waiting for circumstances to bring me peace, then I am going to wait a really long time. In Christmas, we celebrate the love that God reaches out in the midst of the hard journey. The love of God who comes in weakness and vulnerability of a baby born in an out-of-the-way place in an out-of-the-way country to poor, overwhelmed parents. And when I began to think of that story in a new context this year, in the context of coming through 2020 and, and, and understanding the difficulties of the year and life, and I began to process that, I come to the point in my life in which I can say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for coming and and and. and, and Showing yourself, not in the powerful and the extraordinary, but showing yourself in weakness and the familiar because that's me. I get that. Thank you, God, for offering at Journey's End a new beginning. And, and in the setting of, a, of poverty in a stable, you, you show the richest jewel of love that not only reveals in a particular place, you reveal for all nations the character of who you are. Thank you, God for bringing us to Bethlehem, the house of bread, where the empty are filled and the filled uh, are emptied, where the poor finds riches and the rich recognize their poverty, where all who will kneel down before him with their hands open are fed unreservedly by the grace and mercy of God. It can be a long, hard road to Bethlehem or whatever your Bethlehem is right now. But at the end of the road, and not just at the end, in the middle of your road, you can find peace, joy, 
hope, and love. All, all the themes we've been celebrating this Advent season. Love has come. It tore open the heavens on that, on that Bethlehem uh, moment, but, but God is still in the business of tearing open the heavens today. With Christmas now in the rearview mirror, my wish for you is this, is that we would stop seeking peace in our circumstance. We would stop seeking after peace in our possessions or our government or, or even a season in which we light the tree, but that we would find lasting peace in the Prince of Peace. Jesus said, I, I have peace for you. It is not the peace the world gives. And maybe that's the lesson of 2020 Christmas. When the world or our own individual lives feel turned upside down, we have to find the peace of Christ in the presence of the God who breaks in to all of the upside down places. We sang the words earlier. I, I, I hope you heard them. They said, in the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. And I love the last verse. And the church of Christ was born. And the spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel and shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ has resurrected me. You know, I don't know whatever Bethlehem journey you're on today. But would this Bethlehem journey remind you, you are not alone. The God of the universe wants to break in and bring hope and peace and love and joy. And when God breaks in, things are never the same. And so as we get to, to, in a moment, pretty soon in these days to put Christmas away, can I just, invi just invite you to think about inviting God right in the midst of the circumstance where you're at? Because the, the feeling of Christmas goes away, right? The, the, we're going to take next Sunday the tree and the, everything will still be here. Week after that, it's gone. That, that's not what matters. Can I invite you to invite God to break into the circumstance just as he answered the call of his Old Testament people who cried out? Could we cry out in the same way, God, break into my family, break into my medical issues, break into to my marriage, break into my kid's life? God, this is a hard road. But will you break in? And just as he broke in and by Jesus showed just how deep and wide his love is, so now God commissions the church. And God commissions you to do the same, to show the world just how deep and wide his love is by the way you live in the midst of your journey, by the way that you respond in the midst of the journey, is showing who God is. Now, when you invite God to be a part of your journey, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden the, the road is fixed. It doesn't mean that all the potholes are gone. It doesn't mean that there are bridges where there, were, where, where, where there weren't before. That doesn't, it doesn't change those circumstances. What it does is it changes you in the midst of the journey. And if you can be a person who lets the love of Christ shine through you in the midst of the difficult roads then you are showing Jesus to the world that is around you. You are not alone, and neither is anyone else who will kneel at that manger and invite him to break in to your road. God wants to break into your circumstance. God wants to break into your journey. And if you'll let him, things will never be the same. Oh, I know we are, most of us, on the road with the Father. We, we're recognizing we're, we're in this journey with God. And yet, if you're anything like me, there are, there are days I think maybe I've got it figured out better than he or Google combined. 
And I need those reminders, the reminder of the Bethlehem road, especially when the road is hard. That what he wants to do more than anything is not pave the road in front of me, but he wants to walk the road with me. And that in walking the road with me, he's helping me become who he created me to be. And helping me show those that I love who have yet to take that journey what it means to experience real hope and joy and peace. What about you? Would you invite him to break in right where you're at? Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray. Father, how good it is to be together on this Sunday that follows Christmas and sing the Christmas carols and invite your presence. And yet we're also confronted with this passage of Scripture that we've, we've know so well, that's been read so many times. We're confronted with the reality of our own life is sometimes our roads are hard. Are we letting you break in? Christmas, the very, the very story of, of Jesus' birth is about you answering this, this, uh, this call, this cry of your Old Testament people for, for you to come down. And, and now we have this, this great gift that we can pray, oh God, break in by the power of your spirit. Break in fresh. And so we give you this, this hard road, this journey, whatever it is. We give you that kid we're worried about or those parents or, or, or the job or our marriage or, or what a tomorrow holds. God, we want to be a people not of hope nots. That we, we don't want to be a people who are just wishing nothing bad happens. We want to be a people who hope that your kingdom comes, your will is done right here on earth, and we want to be a part of it. So in this Christmas of 2020, Father, break in in ways that we have never seen you break in before, not because you haven't been willing, but because we've been holding back. We've been trying to sustain ourselves. But Lord, we want to just lay that down today. We just want to trust you, follow after you, and so that Christmas continues in January and February and March because the God of the universe is Emmanuel and you walk with us. Father, I pray upon each situation represented here today, each family, I pray your peace your love, your grace, and your joy be evident not in the things we can hold in our hand, but in the one who holds our hand. You are good, and we give you praise. Go with us from this place. May joy be contagious because it comes from you. And may it get all over our neighbors as well until all your children find their way home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you on your journey. Go in his peace.